It's a shame when a film is said to be based off a certain script, but then the last minute plans change. But it happens from time to time. But it's crazy to read the script for the original Halloween for The Return of Michael Myers because had the script never been scrapped, Halloween would certainly have turned out differently. I mean, Halloween 4 introduced Jamie Lloyd, we all know the story, Laurie Strode faked her death following the events of Halloween Night 1978, and that left Jamie and Rachel front row and centre for the film. But writer Dennis Etchison never had Rachel or Jamie set to star in the film, and it's fascinating, because the movie was actually supposed to follow up on Tommy Doyle and Lindsay Wallace. They still lived across the street from each other, and 10 years later, they're still affected with what happened 10 years prior. Thanks to an interview Blumhouse done with Dennis, we learned how Halloween 4 originally should have turned out. So, let's talk about it. Dennis first got in talks with Carpenter because he and Deborah Hill wanted him to do the novelization of 1980's The Fog. One day out of the blue, I got a call from somebody in John's office who said, John Carpenter would like to meet with you. Well, that was great because I'm a great fan of his. And I said sure, and I went in the next day, and I met with him and Deborah Hill. Deborah took me into another room and sat me down and said they needed the novelization for the fog. Somebody else had written one but she didn't like it and, and they weren't going to use it. She said he, the other writer, had a reporter having sex with ghosts on the beach. It's terrible. We don't have much time and we need someone to do it. And somebody recommended you. Dennis went on to say I'm very visual when I write. I didn't want to visualize it in a way that was different from the film. At some point in the next few days Tommy Wallace I think showed me a couple of reels of it. The fog the opening so I can get a flavour and the look of it. And then I got a copy of the script and I studied that. The deal with Bantam Books was they needed it in exactly 6 weeks and I said ok, I can do that. So I signed it, started it and finished it 6 weeks to the day. The Fog went through 8 printings, it did well. And John asked me if I'd like to novelise Halloween 2 and then Halloween 3 and so I did those. At some point after Halloween 3 on Christmas Eve I got a call from John and he said Deborah and I would like you to write the script for Halloween 4 and I said that's wonderful. A few minutes later, Deborah called and said the exact same thing. I started meeting with John and we talked about what would be in it. We agreed that it should start off 10 years after Halloween and the story would concern the two little kids Laurie Strode was babysitting, who were now teenagers, grown up and still living across the street from each other, Lindsay Wallace and Tommy Doyle. The idea is that the town, after all those terrible murders 10 years earlier, has banned Halloween. They don't recognise Halloween as a holiday. They don't allow Halloween masks and costumes or even Halloween candy. And you know Hunt, the deputy from the first two films, well he's now the sheriff. And 10 years of repression and suppression have boiled to the surface and there's some hints that he's back. So I first saw on the poster words, the night he came home, again. And I had this set piece in mind that Michael Myers would come bursting up out of a big lot of pumpkins, erupting out of this big orange mound, that would be a nice shot to use in the poster. At one point there was a speech, they had a town meeting and everyone was up in arms about whether or not they should have Halloween. And the guy who runs the local drive-in, The Lost River, which is the name of a real drive-in, John grew up in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and he said there was a real Lost River drive-in, and Haddafield was also based on a town in New Jersey where Deborah grew up. So there's this town meeting and everyone's arguing, and the guy who runs the town drive-in says, you can't ban a night of Halloween movies, I'm trying to make a living here, kids want to see horror movies. Well maybe they shouldn't. Some people are saying maybe it's better if they don't see them. So the whole idea was repression versus acknowledging the bad things in the world. A few weeks later, I stopped by Deborah Hill's office to pick up a copy of the final retyping of the script. She had a tall stack of them in front of her and said, we're sending these out to investors. And, and then sometime later, I got a call from her saying, I just wanted to tell you, John and I have sold our interest in the Halloween franchise, and unfortunately, your script was not part of the deal. Who knows why? Apparently, the partners hired something like 10 other writers to work on it after me. And I lost the Writers Guild arbitration over the credits, even though I was the first writer on the project, so my name's not even on the picture. Some aspects of Edison's film did stay intact. We saw Michael Myers return 10 years later, and it did ignore the events of Halloween 3, Season of the Witch altogether. A movie without Jamie Lloyd might sound really odd, and, and it's difficult to imagine because this is all now set in stone. So many films were built off the story, but you can't lie, it is extremely interesting to say the least. Dennis was kind enough to provide an actual reading from the script itself, giving us a rare look at the original vision of the film that we've seen so many times. This may seem like a lot to listen to, but don't worry, this is one of the main plot points for the film, so it's definitely one you should hear. Main title sequence, opens a black screen, superimposed in dark red letters Halloween 4. End main titles, fade into, night, Myers house, subjective POV, panaglide. Angle from behind bushes, standing, moving forward, crossing the overgrown lawn, toward the abandoned Myers house, around the porch, to the back door and entering the house. Moving through the dusty kitchen, the dining room, toward a dark, shadowed stairway, 
climbing the stairs through cobwebs to a bedroom, panning right to a dusty box springs, panning left over peeling wallpaper, an old chest of drawers, to a vanity table and a cracked mirror on the wall. Moving to the vanity table, sitting down, now we see dim reflections of parts of the room behind. As two pale hands from below frame appear in one jagged piece of the mirror and bring up a white featureless mask. The screen goes black for a second as the mask is pulled on. Now, through the eye holes we see a figure in the mirror, tilting his head as he considers his reflection. The costume is complete. It is a shape. Fade in two. Black screen. Superimpose. Haddonfield, Illinois, October 31st, 1988. When asked about what kind of possible body count this film would have, Edgerson dives into another stunning scene description. They are decorating for the school Halloween dance, but they can't call it that. They can't have anything that suggests supernatural. Lindsay, no, 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 it's not Lindsay. It's another girl, Darcy. She's going to go out on a triple date with three guys and two other girls, and, and they're going to the Lost River Drive-In, which is having a triple feature show on three screens simultaneously. It's an outdoor multiplex with three screens angled away from each other, and every kid in two counties is going to be there tonight so she's promised she'll have a surprise for them. What she's going to do is bring pumpkins for each of them with their faces carved on the pumpkins. Day. Pumpkin stand, late afternoon. Beyond the city limits where Halloween is in full observance, a pumpkin stand in a lonely corner at the edge of town, just outside the Haddonfield line, on the other side of the street, a sign. Welcome to Haddonfield. On this side, welcome to Harding. As Darcy walks up, she touches a few of the pumpkins uncertainly, as if she knows what she's doing. Apparently the name is Proprietor, but I, ca I can't pronounce it for whatever reason I can't pronounce the name properly, so I'm going to call the Proprietor the Old Man. Old Man, use him, don't bruise him, some of them is mighty ripe. Darcy, how much? Old Man, 10 cents a pound, cash and carry. That one there looks to be about 13 pounds. Darcy digs into her jeans and counts her money. Old Man, of course you can get yourself a little baby one, they're not that much fun though, are they? Darcy, I, I wouldn't know. Old Man, then you must be from Haddonfield. Don't know how to have any fun over there. Closer angle, Darcy. As she smooths her hand over the surface of the pumpkins, all are elongated and misshapen. She makes a face back at each one. They aren't quite right. Darcy, to herself. Richie, Keith and Lonnie. Uh-oh. Suddenly, a knife swoops down and stabs the pumpkin in front of her. Wider angle. Old man. This one will carve up real nice. The old man is standing next to her. He buries the blade to the hilt and starts sawing out eye holes to demonstrate. Darcy. How much have I buy three? The old man. Depends. You could make me a deal. See anything you like? He sticks his own face in front of her and grins, but she looks away, repulsed. He turns back, the pumpkin, cutting the nose and grinning mouth. Darcy. Uh, I don't think so. Thanks, anyway. She starts to leave, but he is in front of her, with his knife blade dripping juice and seeds. Old man. You don't like him. He's my favourite. I call him Freddy. Darcy. Uh, you wouldn't know another... Forget it. Old man, where are you going? I got everything you need right here. Take a look. He goes to the side of the stand and gestures at the lot behind. Angle to the lot. Behind the stand is a vacant lot with hundreds of more pumpkins. Trucked in for the holiday, like a Christmas tree lot that's full once a year and empty for the rest of the time. Mounds of pumpkins, all sizes and shapes, all very ripe and deep orange under the setting sun. Darcy walks forward into the pumpkin land, dazzled. Darcy. Wow. Y you mind if I... Old man, go ahead. Feel him. Rub up against them. Take your time. She walks away as the old man pulls a half point out of his pocket and unscrews the top. It's empty. Old man. I'll, I'll be back. Two minutes. Darcy. Whatever. Behind him, the old man crosses the street to a liquor store, following Darcy into the lot. She steps into the lot, still dazed, more pumpkins than she's ever seen before, walking as if on eggshells. She finds a nice round one, bends over to pull it out, and the whole stack collapses around her. She gets up awkwardly and steps on a ripe one. Her foot sinks into a rotten pulp, but she shakes it off and steps down on another one. Darcy. Shit. She hides the broken pumpkins, but then carries the one she chose to the edge of the lot. She goes back, selects a second, then a third, standing there, satisfied. Her back to the lot. Low angle. Moving. Panaglide. Fast truck at ground level, following a single pumpkin as it breaks loose from the stacks and rolls faster and faster towards Darcy. She hears it coming, starts to look down. Angle on Darcy. Too late. It hits the back of her legs like a bowling ball and knocks her off her feet. She then sprawls backwards, splat, smashing pumpkins. She tries to get up, slips on wet pulp. No more pumpkins rain down on her in a chain reaction. She's half buried. Darcy's point of view. A dark figure towering over her. Angle on Darcy. She fights her way out from under as a dark figure falls on her. She screams, but it's only a scarecrow in a black coat. Part of the display. She pushes it away and gets up. 
her hands and arms dripping with chunky slime, cracked pumpkins all around, standing amid a battlefield of broken shells. She looks down the street, still no sign of the old man. The three pumpkins sit apart in front. She's got to get them out of there before he gets back and sees the damage. Now he's coming out of the store. No time. She'll have to get away fast. She starts to cross the lot laterally, staying out of sight behind the stand. A pumpkin rolls down and taps her ankle. She steps aside it, then another one, and another one. No time to look back. Keep moving. Now, an avalanche behind her as the largest mound erupts and the shape bursts forth from beneath. They topple her from behind like a tempin, and then the pumpkins rain down, burying her completely. Sounds of her screaming for help as her hand digs out, as the blade of a large butcher knife rises in the air, flashing a reflection of the red sunset. The knife acts down again and again. Orange pieces go flying as the pumpkins nearby are splattered with blood. If we got this version of Halloween 4, it would be very possible that this setting would have been used for the poster like Dennis originally wanted. He goes on to say, it ends up with an enormous climax. Tommy and Lindsay go on the run, into the countryside, away from Haddonfield. Lindsay hasn't been able to remember anything that happened in 1978. She has no memory of it. It's blacked out of her mind, and her mother wants it that way. Tommy on the other hand, they both saw shrinks for a while when they were kids, and Tommy is beginning to get some flashes of it and begins to understand what's happening. Whenever he tries to call Lindsay from across the street, the mother never accepts the call. Don't call here again, Tommy girl, because it will remind Lindsay of what happened. But they're bonded together because of what they went through, and they're grown up now, and they kind of like each other, but she's not allowed to see him. Anyway, it ends up with this tremendous bloody scene at the pack drive-in at midnight. It's really incredible, and the shape is there, and he's stalking and killing people right, left, and center. Tommy and Lindsay get away, and they wake up in a farmhouse outside of town, in the country somewhere, and she has had a dream that starts to bring it all together for her. In short, it's not just a slasher film. The story has a philosophy behind it. So like Dennis said, we're reading the script, it sets the story that Tommy and Lindsay, they, they have their own farm and that's where they live, t together of course, and the ending also sees Michael disappear and not get killed, nor captured by the police, so I'm going to of course leave the whole script in the description so you can read it for yourself, but uh, it would be absolutely crazy if we ever did see this version of the film, obviously we won't, but um, it, it's really cool to think about though. And it certainly would change the course of the franchise because if if they did go ahead and, and, and make this movie, John probably never would have sold his interest in the franchise and then John may have been in, in, involved with the future films. But uh, I don't know. I think it's very interesting to talk about anyway. Um, thanks so much for checking out the video. If you liked it, please consider subscribing, leaving a like rating or a video rating. Uh, it helps get the video out there so more people will see it. Anyway, I'm going to leave you off here. It's been a while uh, since I've made a video on Halloween, so I hope you enjoyed it. Other than that guys, thanks so much for watching. Now if we got this version of Halloween 4, it would be completely different. Now if we got if we had if we'd gotten this version if we'd gotten this version of Halloween 4, then it's very possible that the setting If this was the version of Halloween 4 that we got, it would be very possible that this setting would have been used for the poster like Dennis actually originally wanted.